Hey guys, it's Ken. So I get lots of requests for lots of videos and I'm excited to do this one. These are the five steps to making millions of dollars tax-free with other people's money. This is exactly how I did it for 30 years experience. If you want to hear more, stay tuned. Hey guys, there's going to be a lot of information in this video. So to make it easier on you, we summarize them into show notes. Just click the link below in the description to grab all of them. Also, as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. And finally, if you want to help support the channel, I have an amazing master course that will help you kickstart your investing journey. You can get $50 off the course if you use the promo code MASTER50. It would mean the world to me if you took a look at it. So step number one, in order for you to be wealthy, you have to understand the patterns of the rich. Why try to recreate the wheel when you can go back and look at what so many people before us have done? One of the things you can study are the patterns of the rich. And so I've done that for you. I've broken it down into three things that I think are really important that you really need to understand if you're going to use your money or someone else's money in order to become wealthy. The very first thing is you need to understand the types of income. So there's portfolio, there's passive, and there's earned income. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. The second one is how this cash flow works. Now, a lot of you know what cash flow is and you casually use the words, but I'm going to show you specifically how to follow cash flow, how cash flow works. And the third one is how to use debt and equity properly. Debt and equity is actually set up for you. It wants you to use it. And I'm going to walk you through some of the best strategies on how to use debt and equity. Once you understand that these are the patterns of the rich and you can figure these out, you'll be on your way. So let's start with the first one. There are basically three types of income. There's earned income, there's passive income, and there's portfolio income. And they're very, very different. So the earned income is exactly what you would think. This is a job. So this is going to work, getting a W-2, getting a paycheck, putting it in the bank, and then going to work. This is basically a nine to five job paid for time. Nothing wrong with that. The majority of the people in the world fall into this category. Learn what the wealthy do. They move over into the next two categories here, which is passive income and portfolio income. Very, very different. The next type of income is passive income. And of course, we talk a lot about this, guys. This is all cash flow. This is money where you invest and then your tenants pay you back through cash flow. This is passive income. It can also happen through a business. Let's say you've got a sandwich shop and you've got people buying your sandwiches and you've got the passive income. Okay, and then there's portfolio income, which is what a lot of people do. I would say most people invest in stocks and funds and they they hope for the dividends and this is this gets also a type of income so another way to think about it let's say let's say we're talking about McDonald's so on an earned income that might be somebody who works at McDonald's on a passive income that might be the person that actually owns the McDonald's let's say let's say they own the actual franchise and they're generating passive income from that franchise and the earned income are the people that work inside of there. On the portfolio income, that might be a McDonald's share. You might have a share of McDonald's, let's say in the stock market. So they're very, very different, all with the exact same company. So now we're gonna talk about cash flow and where does it go? And so most people, of course, work and they get their paychecks and they gotta figure out what they're gonna do with it. So the rich, what they do is they invest and then they spend. And what the poor do or, and the middle class is that they spend and then they invest. It's a very different strategy. So what most people do is they work their job and they get their salary and then they take their income and they buy liabilities. And liabilities typically depreciate. They buy things like cars and boats and they run up their credit cards and then they rely on their job and their income to pay those things off. And they have, of course, car payments and tax payments and things like that. This is the pattern of the poor and the middle class. So now let's talk about the cash flow habits 
of the rich because I think this is very different than the cash flow habits of the poor and the middle class. So what happens is the rich obviously have portfolio income, passive income, and earned income. So there's a lot of very wealthy people that make a lot of money in a W-2 or a job. And so what they do, however, is they take their income and they buy assets here and they use liabilities to do it and then the cash flow go back into the income category. So they're buying assets that are actually appreciating and they're buying assets that produce cash flow. And so this cash flow just continues to pour into this income category so that they're not relying completely on, let's say, their earned income. In other words, they're generating more passive cash flow. And that's the whole difference in the model between the poor and the middle class and the rich. The rich primarily are investing in cash flowing, appreciating assets and letting other people pay them off, which is in turn generating more cash flow and it gets them richer and richer over time. And then the third pattern of the rich is how they see debt. Now, uh, for a lot of people, debt is a bad word. And for me, it's a good word. Now, there is good debt and there's bad debt. And of course, bad debt are things like credit card debt, cash advances, vehicles in many, many cases, consumer debt, payday loans. These are great examples of bad debt. And so you need to understand the difference. Over here, you're going to pay high interest rates. Over here, you're going to pay a lot lower interest rates. Over here, you're gonna to have to pay them off yourself. And over here, in a lot of cases, you're gonna have somebody else pay them off. So that's the difference between good debt and bad debt. On the good debt side, these are mortgages that could be used for rentals, as an example. If you put a renter in there, then the renter pays down your mortgage. I put education on the side of good debt because I do believe that it could pay off for you over time. Business ownership, real estate, investing, those are all things that you could be using debt for. Now, let's talk about debt for a second. Debt is really other people's money. When you guys take your checks or your money and you go to the banks, then that money becomes a liability to the bank. The bank has to pay you interest on that. So the way the bank makes money is by lending it out. So that's in the form of good debt. They also lend it out in the bad debt category. So it's just money being classified in different ways. So how you use debt and how you see debt is gonna make a big difference in how you become wealthy. The second step, how the rich look at these two things, cash flow versus capital gains. For a lot of you, cash flow means exactly that. Cash flow is the net income from a business or from real estate, whereas a capital gain is like buying something and selling it for hire. They're very different strategies. Cash flow tends to be a little more longer term. Capital gains tends to be a little more short term. Cash flow in a lot of cases has better tax situations and capital gains a lot of times has a higher tax liability. So let's take a look at some of the differences between cash flow and capital gains. On a cash flow, we focus on income generation. It's usually monthly or quarterly. Income may be taxable, not always as we've talked about. And cash flows in to pay the expenses. In other words, the cash comes in monthly or quarterly and it pays the operational expenses. That's what we have on our real estate. That's what I have on my management company. This, these are strategies that the wealthy use to live. They're much more predictable, although some people don't think that they are. I'm telling you they are. In other words, all we gotta do is manage our tenants. And over here on the capital gains side, you know, how do you manage Bitcoin? How do you manage stocks? Uh, you guys know the difference there. So. These are typically more predictable. On the capital gain side, you're usually focused on increasing the value of some kind of asset that you're involved in. You might have higher taxes over here and the gains usually stay in the account. In other words, you're not really cash flowing on this side of the equation. And these strategies are typical for employed investors. The way I like to talk about this is with dairy cows. Now, obviously, you guys all know what a dairy cow is. So there's two philosophies when it comes to a farmer. There's one farmer that buys a dairy cow and waits for the beef to go up and then sells the cow. 
And then of course, that's a capital gain strategy. You buy the cow, you fatten it up, you grow it, and then you sell it. Whereas the dairy farmer is very different. That's more like a cash flow strategy. That's keeping the same cow for years and milking the cow and producing milk over a long period of time. Those are very different philosophies. Those are very different farming strategies, but that's the difference between capital gains and cash flow. The third big thing is that you guys need to be able to create value for the person that you are asking. In other words, when you're asking for money or you're trying to borrow money or you're trying to borrow equity or you're trying to build a business or whatever it is, you have to bring value. If you're trying to get a job, you have to bring value. If you create value for the other person, then you're gonna have a much higher success. So let me give you a couple examples. Number one, create value for others and then participate in that value. So in other words, whatever you create, why not just take a piece of what you create? I have lots of friends that have done this with companies. In other words, they buy companies, let's say for a million bucks or 10 million bucks and the revenues are whatever they are. And they participate in the value that they create be above that. In other words, the owner of the business is happy because they're making up to that point. And the new buyer is really happy because they get some of the overage and they just work on a percentage of a split. This is exactly how businesses and real estate are sold every single day. Number two, increase the assets cash flow. Now we talk a lot about this in our videos, but how can you as an operator, increase the cash flow of the asset. If you do this, then you're creating value for that asset and for the money and for the debt and for yourself. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about this, but this is income minus expenses equals the NOI minus the debt equals cash flow. If you can figure out one of these areas to either increase the income, lower the expenses, to increase the NOI, or potentially even lower the debt, then you can increase the cash flow. Just keep in mind, guys, that people, lenders, they invest in cash flow. They're always taking a look. If I give you money, what's my return going to be? So if you guys focus on cash flow and creating value for that investor or the person that you're going into partnership with, then you, of course, will participate in the bigger picture. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a fourplex and it's 400 grand and you don't have the $100,000 down and you know that these rents are low. In other words, these are, let's say four times 2K a month equals $8,000 as an example. And you know that you can grow that to 10. So that's a deal that an investor might be happy with, but you don't have the 400K and you don't have the 100K. So you go to an investor and you say, I don't have the 100K, but I have the deal. So you sit down with the investor and you show them that you can grow the rents to say $10,000. In other words, each unit is now $2,500 each. So you've been able to grow the rents to $10,000. Your expenses are gonna stay the same and you're now gonna have $5,000 in net operating income. So you, what you've done is you've done that by growing the rents. You can also do that by lowering the expenses. As an example, there are plenty of things that you can do inside on the utilities, on the insurance, on the property tax appeals, et cetera, to be able to lower the expenses as well. But for this purposes, let's just say that you saw a value add opportunity of $500 a unit and you were able to grow the income by $2,000 a month. Okay, so your debt is gonna stay about the same and uh, we'll keep that at, at 1,500. So now your cash flow is 3,500. So under the first scenario, it's a pretty good deal. There's about $18,000 of cash flow against $100,000 investment. So this is about an 18% cash on cash return. Now, you're gonna have some vacancy. This isn't perfect. Your debt might be a little higher. Your expenses might be a little higher, a little lower, but you kind of get the point. But now what you're doing is you're showing them a $2,000 value add. And so now you're going from 18,000 to 42,000. So what you've done is you've more than doubled your cash flow. So you should be able to participate 
and this over here, what you've done is you've used somebody else's money, you've taken the property, you've grown the income through hard work and through things that you've been able to see, and you've grown the cash flow. So now you're participating in the $42,000 a year. So this is a great example of a value add, and these happen every single day. So now let's take a look at using OPM or other people's money. This is a very important piece. So a lot of people don't understand the power of this, the power of leverage, the power of using other people's money. I believe that you're lazy if you use your own money. I used to do this when I first started. Obviously, you save as much as you can, you invest it all, and then soon you're out of cash. The second piece is you gotta understand why people lend. People lend money because people park money in things like banks. They park money in things like pensions. They park money in things like insurance policies. In order for those things to be able to generate some kind of return, they have to lend it out. And that's why as a real estate investor, I get money from banks. I get money from insurance companies. I get money from pensions. That's why they lend. So there's no better time than right now, guys, to do this because there's all kinds of money going into savings and looking for a home. And these banks, these insurance companies, these pensions are looking to invest and they're looking for, for deal makers just like you. So what they're going to do is they're going to give it to you in the form of leverage. And so the debt, let's say, might cost you, let's say, 3%. And the equity might cost you, let's say, 7%. But if you can get... 3% at, like say, 70% of the deal and only have the remaining part, then your blended cost of capital is going to be really, really, really low. And so the whole point here, though, is to find the deal and then go out and find the debt and the equity. You do not have to have your own money to do this. The lazy use their own money. You don't have to do that. The world revolves around this kind of a system. The world revolves around a financial system just like this. Most of the people hand their money over to other people. And what they do is they look for good people like yourself to be able to take that and invest it in good deals so that you make them money and you make yourself money. So let me give you a real example of a property that we did. So we found this property and it was a property that was for sale for $19 million. It was 265 units sitting in a beautiful area of Arizona. And we went to the bank and we said, how much do you think that you're gonna be able to give us in the form of debt? And the property at the time had about a $700,000 NOI, which of course is income minus expenses. And so the bank said, based on a $700,000 NOI, we think we can give you a debt of about $15 million. And of course, what's the difference between 19 and 15? It's $4 million. So at this point, we had to find $4 million of equity. And of course, we didn't have all that money. We had some money, but we were going to have to go out and syndicate that money and figure that out. So why would somebody invest in this? That's because this particular property here also had a $100 per unit value add. In other words, every single unit, we knew that we were gonna be able to get another $100. It was under rented, it was poorly managed, and we had the ability to put things in there like a washer and dryer, which was an extra $40 a month per unit, things like that. So the bank said, we'll give you 15 million, which is about a $400,000 a year payment, and that's gonna give you a cash flow of about $300,000. What that is, that's 300,000 against the 4 million, that's almost a 9% cash on cash return. So that's how we raised the money. We raised the money by telling the investors, we think the property is gonna produce about 300,000, but we need $4 million. But as I said earlier, we believed that we had a $300,000 value add. So what that did is that raised our NOI to about $1 million, this is actually 1.1 million by the end of the third year, going into the fourth year. And then we take this property back to the bank. And at this point, guys, our payment, of course, is still 400,000. So we're making about six to 700,000 a year in cash flow. So our investors are obviously are very, very happy, well over a 10% cash on cash return. What happened, of course, is we went to the bank and say, what do you think the property's worth now? And so we went and got an appraisal and it appraised at $25 million because we had grown the net operating income by $300,000. And we said, okay, great. 
So what kind of a loan will you give us? And they said, we'll give you a $20 million loan. I said, awesome. So what did we do with that 20 million? We paid off the 15, so that loan's gone. We paid off the investors. Now the investors are infinite. They have no investment in the property anymore, but they're still owners. And we distributed about another million dollars because 20 million minus 19 was an extra million dollars that we distributed. So here's the cool part. But our, our debt went up to 700K and of course our cash flow went down to 400K because it was a lot more than that. So let's fast forward. Now we're also getting some rental appreciation and we started to see that our net operating income went up to 1.5 million. We went back to the bank again and said, what do you think it's worth? And they said, we think it's worth about $30 million. So we said, okay, why don't we take another, get some more debt against it? So we put $25 million of debt. So of course we pay off this $20 million and now we have another $5 million that we distribute to the investors. And the payment of course went up to about a million dollars and the cash flow was about 400K. So what we did was here, we became infinite at, in the fourth year and then we kept distributing and we still own this property today and we're still putting new debt on this. And by the way, this is all tax free because this is a cash out refi. This is a cash out refi. And the money that we're distributing here and the money that we're distributing there is all not taxable because of what's called depreciation. What we had the whole time is we had a depreciation expense of about 500K and so what we showed was a negative taxable income of 200K annually. So the investors got 300 grand in year one, but they reported a $200,000 loss. And the same thing happened all the way along in all the other years. This is a great way to get tax-free income using other people's money and returning it all and being infinite in the deal and having long-term perpetual cash flow. This is the biggest difference between cash flow and capital gains right here. This is the way that the rich get wealthy.